Well, welcome everyone into time series and trend analysis. So uh, last piece of new work for us to get our heads around and uh, trust we can do that well. Um, probably might only need 40 minutes. Uh, let's see how we go. We'll just walk you through some slides, summary of the textbook. We'll work a couple of examples and see it does sort of lend itself finding the slope and the y-intercept, looking at indexes, so a lot of that we'll find some practical examples, but, but definitely finding the slope and the y-intercept very similar to our work from last week in regression analysis. Um, one of the things that we're doing in time series analysis is just working out what is going on, what are these lumps and bumps over time, and there are a few of them. Uh, there's the seasonal variation, cyclical variation, random variations, but what we can do to make it easy to predict the long-term trend is we can smooth out some of these irregularities and enables us to really map uh, where we're headed. So here's a, a, a visual display of uh, the different cycles that might be going on. Let's, let, let's focus on the, um, the red line for a moment. So that's the, if you look at time here down the bottom, that's essentially our seasons, perhaps winter, summer, winter, summer. And so we have a peak season and an off-peak season, perhaps, depending on whether you're, you know, if you're a tourist destination in the snow, then obviously it's the reverse. Uh, winter's the peak season and summer's not. But depending on uh, your product and your service, uh, you'll have these seasonal fluctuations. And then on top of that, let's have a look at the purple line. The purple line here is just the unexpected irregular fluctuations due to you know there's a surge in demand or a drop in demand for a variety of reasons maybe there's a strike um, there's an, a pandemic there is um, a flood um, some sort of uh, some sort of localized issue uh, and and that just over a week or two or a month or two you know we'll see fluctuations up and down within the seasonal fluctuations as well and then on top of that, uh, we've got um, this trend happening as well. The seasonal fluctuations are happening on top of the cyclical trend, which is more, more or less happening over a, a three to four year period, maybe even five to six, where you've got um, the economy is booming and then moves into recession and then booms again and goes into recession. Uh, it's very hard to um, business confidence, that's sort of tied up with business confidence and, you know, um, what causes people to cut back, there's a whole lot of factors in terms of, you know, unemployment and inflation and government spending and, and a whole lot of international issues and trade are, are, are affecting this curve. But underneath all of it, we can see uh, a potential uh, long-term trend. And the difficulty is if you were relying on the um, cyclical uh, movement to try and predict the future, you know, where do you draw the line? You could start to draw the line just in this period here, if you're trying to predict, you know, 10 years into the future. The problem is you'll be on the wrong trajectory, or do you start in this period here? And you might be thinking, oh, the future's looking pretty bleak. So if you really do want to predict um, trends right over a 10 or 11 or 12 year period, you really need to have some historical data going back that far at least, so you can then look into the future and predict and see the long-term trends. So um, again, we've said a, a few times through this unit that a picture paints a thousand words and a, and a great way to visualize data is to graph it. And so uh, a lot of reports and a lot of you know investment analysis, uh, we rely on graphs. It just, it's very, very easy for us to capture a sense of, you know, the health of the company or what's going on. Some of the buttons that you, if you chose to use your financial calculator to calculate um, the trend, the, the re least squares regression line, for example, would be very similar to um, uh, our work, at uh, least, yeah, 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 our work last week. Uh, we would be going uh, mode one, one, uh, because we are, we're looking at uh, a line and it's normally time on the x-axis and whatever we're trying to measure on the y-axis normally over time if we're trying to find a trend 
And so um, it would be mode one, one, and then to enter the X data again, imagine, um, you know, X data was 12, 12, and then press X, Y, and the Y data was 250, key 250, press enter. This is very similar to last week. Uh, but what that enables us to do is go recall A, you'll recall that's going to give us the Y intercept, recall B will give us the slope, B sloping down the hill, if you wanted the memory jogger, and this correlation, uh, how, str how strong is the line in terms of predicting trends, the closer the dots are to um, 1, the, the, the closer our R is to 1, the closer the dots are to the line and the and the reliability of R as a predictor in into the future. Um, this C is uh, if you were doing an exponential or a quadratic. Uh, so what what that would do is normally be so uh, we would have maybe C X squared X being time for example, and that is when we have an exponential function we we won't have a straight line. We're focusing on a straight line, so we will only need A and B. But if you, sometimes you may be predicting and need an exponential curve, which may be a better fit for the data that you're using. So one of the methods we could use to smooth out uh, and find and predict trends is the semi-averages method. It's the simplest. Pretty much all we do if this was our data is we don't divide the data into two, divide it into halves. And so what, what we could do is um, find the bottom half, don't worry about it. if there's an odd number, have one piece in the middle and then the top half, and then average the bottom half, average the top half, or add up the bottom half and the, and the top half, divide by the number, one, two, three, four, five, so divide by five, and we've got two points for our semi-average. We could graph that next to 2007 on the x-axis, we could graph 5963, plot one point, and next to 2013 on the x-axis, plot 8914, and we've got enough to draw a line between the two, and we'll, let's see how good it is as a measure of fit. So um, the real data, the actual plotted data is, you know, moving up and down, our semi-average line, there's the two points plotted that we talked about, and we draw the line, and it's a pretty good fit. Um, the, 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 the line is it's uh, up and down over the line, but pretty close to it. That's what we'd like. We don't really want the line to be um, uh, all, all the way below it or all the way above it. We want it to be pretty much crisscrossing uh, the actual data, so that's a good fit. It's close to the line. Let's have a look at least squares linear regression. Um, what you can use if you're graphing things over time, uh, you don't necessarily have to follow uh, his technique here. You, you can uh, use your x-axis as, as uh, time. Uh, but he tries to make the calculations a little easier and converts. We'll, we'll talk about how he converts the x-axis and then when you want to interpret. You'll get the same result when you try and predict into 2016, 2017. You will get the same result. But for ease of calculation, he does a little trick, but you don't have to. The slope will be the, will be the same. The y-intercept will be different, but the slope will be the same. So. Um, so as I was saying before, if you really wanted to predict for 2016, you could just enter these as your X values and these as your Y values. What he has done, he's thinking if you had to do this manually, he's tried to make it easy. You know, Instead of squaring 2005, he's squaring a smaller number. You're getting the same slope and you can get the same prediction. What, what happens though, when we do go to predict, predict into the future, we're going to say, wow, well, look, if 2015 is 5, then 2016 must equal 6. So I'll have to key in 6 to and predict the slope, use the slope to predict and the intercept to predict uh, future equations. Whether if you if you just use these, you obviously you would just key in X as 2016, or if you're trying to predict to 2017, you key in x equals 2017.
But anyway, what he's done then is he's divided the data and he's, and he's found the middle and he's put zero in the middle and then he's worked backwards to the top to, to minus five and then forwards to 2015. So 10 years uh, represented there and zero bang in the middle. And then we follow these calculations. We really don't need to do it all, but it's nice to see what's going on in the engine room. There is a looking at the, you know, the difference, the movement in X versus the movement in Y. So our slope is the sum of the, uh, the, the X variables and the Y variables multiplied together divided by the um, sum of X squared. So those two figures there will give me the slope. A lot of calculations involved, um, but uh, the clerical accuracy, we can take a lot of the hack work out of it by either using Excel or the financial calculator, just as we did in uh, last week's regression uh, analysis. So, uh, and there is the, the prediction for Y equals the Y intercept, uh, over the y-intercept, sorry, plus the slope times whatever the x-value is. So if we plugged in uh, what we were talking about before, if I wanted to make a prediction for 2016, I would key in 6. 6 times the slope plus that y-intercept will give me my prediction for 2016. So again, the calculator uh, if we really, if we were going to enter the data as he has entered and get the same intercept, same, we, we talked about it before, mode 1, 1, second function, alpha 0, 0, and then we'd go 5 plus minus, make it a negative, xy, 4701, enter. Watch the screen carefully, scroll down to check your results, and you can edit them and change the results if you made a mistake entering the data. But if you'd entered all the data correctly, recall B will give me the slope, recall A will give me the y-intercept. What about if we were using Excel? Pretty much key the data in. And there are two formulas in Excel. Uh, the slope, or what we're going to do is just this formula here. We just go equals slope, tell it where the y-values are, comma, tell it where the x-values are, close bracket, hit enter, bam, it's found the slope for you. Intercept, same sort of thing. The formula is equals intercept, open bracket, tell it where the y's are, tell it where the b's are, just scroll in, scroll down, it'll highlight the, the cells for you, close the bracket, hit enter, and you've found the y-intercept. So therefore, if we did uh, want to find out, uh, let's imagine you want to find out what 2017, the prediction for 2017 is. If 2015 was 5, 2017 the x value is 7. So key that in uh, your y-intercept plus the slope times x, 7, and you've got 10,598. Using the financial calculator, it does make it a little bit easier. Scroll back a little bit so you can see it. We've got this little y prediction, so we could just go 6, second function, open bracket. And because we hit the gold, gold is the expected value of y, it would give us the answer. What about 2017? 7, second function, open bracket, will give us the predicted value of y. <coughs> Excuse me. For any y value, you could go backwards, and you could key the y result, and then go second function x and it would predict what x must have been if you knew the value for y. It's just playing around with that same slope intercept formula. What about moving averages? Very similar to semi-averages. Uh, we're doing a three-year moving average here so we really don't have enough data. If we're starting in 2001 we don't have three years worth to, to have an average but by, t by year three we do. So we can add up those three years and then find, divide by three to get the average. Now these three years, it's a moving average, so the next three years, add it up and divide by three. And we just keep moving it down the line. The last, you know, the last three, add the three up and divide by three. 
What we can see happening with the moving average is it does tend to smooth out the line a little bit. You can see this jump from 67 to 121, whereas the moving average just jumped from 44 to 80. So the movements, and then 121 down to 45, here it jumped from 80 to 78. So the jumps aren't as severe. So here is the, uh, the two graphs. This is the real data the real rainfall, and here's the moving average, smoothing it out, doesn't drop as low, smoothing it out, and doesn't climb as high. But you still get an idea of whether the trend is more up or down, and, it, and this is typical, you would sort of expect to be crossing, crossing the line. What about a five-year moving average? Same as a three-year, funnily enough, but it's five years. So we don't have enough data for four, one, two, three, four. First four years, nothing to work with, but the fifth year, add them up, divide by five, we've got a five month, five year moving average. And again, we can see that the variations aren't quite as much. Let's have a look at what it graphs like. Uh, again, um, interesting, interesting graphs. Yes, we don't have enough to graph, so you pretty much ignore the line here. A moving average didn't start until here, but again, it doesn't drop as low at all. It, it cuts across and then slowly starts to climb as the trend is climbing and starts to match the, the real data. So we get a bit of a sense of uh, where we're going in the long term. What about exponential smoothing? Is that a good way of smoothing out some of the lumps and bumps? So it's a little formula here, the smoothed value, Sx, uh, when you see y, x is the actual value, and Sx minus 1 is the smoothed value from the previous period or the previous observation. And, and the, the, the alpha is the what smoothing constant you're going to use for the current um, actual data, and 1 minus alpha, 60%, you're going to smooth out the previous smooth figure. So we're getting sort of this averaging thing happening here. Let's go and have a look at what it looks like. So this is the real data. Here are the observations. So once we start to smooth, again, we don't have enough for year 2005. We've only got one piece of data. So we're just going to, we can't do anything with that. We're just going to bring that across to there and maybe we're going to put it as a smooth value, even though technically it's not smooth. But it's this, let's say it's this, it's, we're going to take 60% because we've decided to use alpha, the smoothing factor of 0.4. It's your call. You could run with 0.2, 0 0.8. If you ran with 0.8 as your smoothing factor, then you'd go with 1 minus 0 0.8, 0 0.2 as the, the other factor. So it all has to add up to 1. So we've chosen to run with 0.4. So therefore, we're running with 0.6 to smooth out the smoothed figure. Let's see how it works. So again, this is just saying smooth the current stuff and uh, with 0.4 and smooth the old smoothed figure with 0.6. Let's see it in operation. So uh, we've dragged down the 47.6 to here. Got that, that's how we we're about to smooth that in a moment. And we're now going to smooth it with 0.6. So I'm going to get that 47.6 and multiply by 0.6 and that's going to give me 28.56. Now I'm going to smooth the current data with 0.4, my alpha rate of 0.4. Current data, current observation is 48.9. 48.9 times 0.4 equals 19.56. Then we just add the two smoothed figures together, that plus that equals my, my smooth figure. Drag the smoothed figure down and we repeat the whole process again. Multiply this smooth figure by 0.6, multiply this figure, the current figure, by 0.4 and add the two together and it keeps repeating. Uh, Excel is a very handy tool. If you're smoothing a table, it's very, very quick, very easy and you just write a couple of formulas. We'll have a crack at doing that in class. And once you've write, written the formulas, you'll find it takes a lot of the clerical potential clerical errors out of our smoothing table. 
You may be asked to smooth something like this or work out what the smoothed figures are in some sort of assessment event at some point. And this is what the uh, real data looks like over time, the real data. Now, interestingly, our smoothed curve, smoothed curve is um, always underneath it. Not sure if that's always the case. It isn't, actually. If we picked a different smoothing figure, we may well have found that we, we, we ended up with a line that got closer. And you can use a bit of trial and error and try and work out at what's, what's, what is the best smooth? The best smoothing technique is the one that gets you closest to the line. So I don't think this is ideal, actually, smoothing at 0.4. We might actually experiment with this data and, and try smoothing at different, uh, different rates and see if we can't get a better smoothing effect. So um, we'll do that when we get to class on uh, next time. We could use um, uh, the data analysis tool in Excel, throw in the observations, ask for data analysis, exponential smoothing, click OK, tell it where the data is and uh, work out what your smoothing factor is and press OK and away you go. It will smooth it for you and will also produce a graph the actual data versus the smoothed figures. When I say that, I mean, you have to insert the graph, um, but yeah, you can, you, can, uh, you can do that, but we'll do that in class. So uh, we've got two chapters to walk through, um, maybe halfway if you want to take a break, certainly hit pause and, and do that. If you need to stand up and stretch, do whatever you need to do to get through. I'll try and make it as interesting as I can. Um, and let's move into index numbers, see what we can do with that. Index numbers are very handy, very helpful. They get you, they help you uh, understand the movement over time. They understand, you know, the increase. Uh, you can visualize what's going on. So the first thing we might do is get the price in the, just if we want to calculate the price relative, just grab the new price and divide by the price in the base period or old period. So I, I go N for new, O for old, if you like. That's your base period there. So price relative, that's all we've got to do is grab the new price, put it over the base price. So if it said, um, look, I'd like to, I'd like to find the price relative uh, if 2008 was the base period for 2011 for eggs. So we pick up the data for 2011 and divide by the data for 2008. We get $5.10 divided by $4.46 equals 1.143. It makes sense that if both values were the same, if it was $5.10 on top and $5.10 underneath, we'd end up with one. There would be no increase. Because we get $5.10 over $4.46, we get 1.143. So really what it's saying is this is this in relation to this is one itself plus the increase. The increase represented there is 14.3%. 0.143. Then we can um, just multiply the price relative by 100 to get a simple price index. So let's have a look at that and see what that means. If we just went back a little bit, really all we would do is to convert this price relative into a price index is multiply by 100. Multiply by 100, move the decimal places, 2 to the right, and we get 114.3. Still saying the same thing, it's a 14.3% increase. Let's see what happens with this index over here. If you were to see an index of 107.3, you would know there's been a 7.3% increase. If you get something that's less than 100, you know that the price has dropped, or that it's gone down by 100 minus 86.4, which is 13.6% decrease there. Um, what's happening here, uh, if we wanted to um, calculate a price relative, uh, so again, similar sort of thing, working the question out, we're looking at uh, frozen peas here, frozen peas, looking at 2011 relative to 1996. Pick up the two prices, 
229 divided by $1.33 multiplied by 100 and we get 172.2. It means there's been a 72.2% increase in the price of frozen peas from 1996 to 2011. So this is very similar to how we might use and interpret the um, All Ordinaries Index. And uh, just to give you a bit of a heads up on, you can certainly, uh, if you were to click onto this website here, you would find um, there's around about 2,300 companies that goes up and down over time, but there's quite a handful of companies listed, public companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. And when you want to find any particular company, uh, find out what their code is, you can just look them up alphabetically um, or just search in their, you know, um, Commonwealth Bank or something. Hit go and it'll find it for you. But um, looking at the All Ordinaries Index and how it might be uh, calculated, if you wanted to graph that over time, you could go to Yahoo Finance. Um, go to Google, type Yahoo Finance Australia, um, click on that'll do us, ASX indices, indices I should say. Now, the All Ordinaries, it covers the whole market. Um, the ASX 200, top 200 capitalised ASX 200 there and other indexes are available. But let's go for the All Ordinaries and uh, let's have a look at how that's calculated. Uh, you could, if you wanted to download them, you can set, they go back to 1984. So you get about 36 years worth of uh, All Ordinaries data and you could select daily, weekly, monthly. Monthly is good enough, get prices and you click download down here and you can download and produce a graph similar to that. And uh, the interest, it's interesting to see what's happened since uh, COVID. Here's the, the global financial crisis back in 2007, 2008. But let's have a look, um, just playing around with some figures for a moment. Imagine on the 16th of August, 2011, nine years ago, say, the index was 4349, and the next day, the 17th, it was 4320. Well, how is that calculated? The same way as you saw a moment ago, it's basically this price new over price old. It's, uh, in, it's, it's how the index is calculated. So what would happen is, imagine you've got those 2,300 companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, and you listed the total number of shares, thousands and thousands of shares in each of those companies, and multiplied by the current market price at the end of trading, say, on that day. And maybe the value came to that figure well, this is going to illustrate the beauty of an index because you look at that and your brain has trouble getting your head around, you know, large numbers. And then um, the next day, uh, same sort of thing happens. Total number of shares on the market times the current share price. And you've got the capitalised value. And notice it's not necessarily going to be the balance sheet value. We know that the balance sheet shown historical cost that people are prepared to pay more for the shares than the, than the company's worth on the balance sheet because they're looking for potential, you know, share price growth and profits and dividends and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so what would happen is the way the index would be calculated is essentially we say, give me yesterday's index times today's value minus yesterday's value, and I've got. Um, today's index. And so what I'm saying is that the real, the, the percentage decrease or increase from there to there is exactly the same decrease from there to there. But your head can certainly do math, math you know, look at the decrease a lot more easily there and you can, and it's easier to graph, easier to get your head around and, and um, just, you, you, it's a barometer. You get, that's the beauty of an index. You get a good feel for what's going on in the market. And just using, utilising just a little bit of your knowledge from compound interest and future values and present values, uh, we could do that. Imagine you can use your skills that you've developed in this subject to predict the future, essentially, um, over a long term. You know, the, 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 the deal is that over 36 years, even though there's lots of ups and downs, you can see the underlying trend. And you can now use this past data to predict another you know, 36 years potentially into the future by looking at that trend. And you could say with some reasonable certainty that if I had 
uh, if my portfolio is worth 450,000 and it was able to, the particular shares I'd invested in happened to match the All Ordinaries Index. Of course, your portfolio could do better, could do worse, but let's imagine it did just the same as the rest of the companies on the Australian market. Uh, what would it be worth today? So all we've got to do is find uh, your current index value, divide by the value back when your portfolio was there, and multiply by your portfolio value. Let's have a look at it on the next page. Portfolio value back then times current index, divide by uh, the old index, and you could be reasonably confident that you would be expecting you know, your portfolio to be around that value in the future. Of course, I'm using historical data, but I'm using it as a bit of an example. And if you said, now applying your uh, way, way back before Easter, when we were doing um, present value, future values, and you said, wow, I wonder what rate increase, what's my capital return? What is my share price uh, value? How much has it gone up? Uh, what's my capital growth, so to speak? So what we would do is put the present value in 450,000. One of them needs to be a negative if, if you're looking at P, PV plus future value. So we'll put 596 plus minus, make it a minus, hit the future value. And then how many years are you looking at? So work out what sort of period you're looking at and key that in and compute I. And so we, this particular data that we were looking at, that represents on average an 8.4% return per year in capital gains. Um, over that period, if you were getting 5% in dividends, your overall return on these shares has been about 13%. So you could use that um, technique to um, predict for your own personal finances, should you be investing in shares or even property. Same principle applies. If you know what the growth has been in the past, you can predict into the future. This is interesting, just one last thing and we'll move on, and that is that if the dividends, you know, profits are a function essentially of, of, of your, um, sorry, dividends are a function of profit, and if, if profits aren't growing and you can't grow your dividends, if, if you just maintain the same level of dividends year after year after year, if the price goes up, the share price goes up, then your dividend yield has to come down. Same dividend over a, le over a lesser value, higher dividend yield, same dividend over a higher value, lower dividend yield. So um, let's get back into our indexes again. Now, hopefully that's a practical example. You can see the application of indexes and how you might apply them. Uh, here, a simple aggregate index. Add up all the price in the new period and add up all the prices in the base period or the old period and multiply by 100. So let's have a look. If we had to do a simple aggregate index uh, for 2011, we would just add up the prices for 2011 and they came to, uh, sorry, price in the new period came to $15.19. Add up the prices in the old period, they came to $8.79, those prices there, and, and divide them, new, new, some of the new over some of the old, multiply by 100, 172. This aggregate, aggregate index is telling me that again there's been about a 72.8% increase in these particular products from 1991 to 2011. Well, um, I think you call him Las Perret. I think I could I could be wrong, but it's interesting. It sounds more French than German. A German economist. Uh, Ernst Louis Lasperet, 1834 to 1913. He came along and said, well, look, let, let's weight these, the sum of these, uh, let's multiply the um, new price by the quantities in the old period and add it up and then do the same for weight prices in the, sorry, new period with the old, quantities in the old, and weight prices in the base period or old period with quantities in the base or old period. So let's have a look at how that works. Uh, pretty much just follow the deal. Here's my quantity in 2001. Here's my prices in 2001. And I, if I decided I'm going to use, two, he's decided now he's going to use 2006, for example, 
Uh, so I'm going to need to multiply current prices with quantity in the old. So um, current price is $2.92 times 3. Current price is $5.72 times 8. Current price $4.33 times quantity in the old 5 to get that and add it up. This is using last parade. And then uh, same sort of deal with the um, base period, $2.63, price in the base period times quantity in the old period, quantity in the base period, multiply it out. $4.77 times 8, $3.33 times 5, multiply it out, add it up, and get the sum of those two, 7617 divided by 6270 multiplied by 100, we get a less prey index of 121.5 showing a 21.5% increase with these products between 2001 and 2006. You could uh, find all of the different indexes and, and then just average them if you wanted to. Um, so uh, here we are finding the index for oranges, tomato sauce, from one period to the, the new period over the old, new over the old. And then just average all of the indexes. There's another way we could have just uh, said that on average, uh, the average of the relative prices uh, was 190.1, 90% 190 increase in this instance. Well, Les Perret, think about him. He was back here in 1834 to 1913. And not to be outdone, along comes another German economist who again is sounding French, Pache. I'm not sure if that's again how you'd say it. You could Google it if you wanted to. Let's go. I'm going to call him Pache, but I could be well wrong. Anyway, Hermann, that's a good German name, but it just sort of doesn't seem German. But there it is. Um, uh, and he came along and around sort of similar periods, a little tiny bit later, and says, nah, now I'll tell you what we'll do is we will uh, we'll use quantities in the new period, not quantities in the old. Everything else is the same as Les Perret, but he, he's just uh, doing a weight in the new period. And so same sort of application uh, as you saw with Les Perret. Just keep the quantities in the new period, not quantities in the old. Everything else is the same. And we get a, an index of 178. Get the addition of all of the quantities new times quantities, sorry, quantities new and price new. Add them up, divide by the indexes, multiply by 100. Uh, increase of 78.8 using Pache's index. Well, what's the comparison? I guess you could say that I think there's a few little points that the textbook makes. I'm going to just pick up a couple, two of the main ones. Imagine if, if prices were going up and you're using um, uh, what you would expect to happen if prices are increasing is maybe demand will drop. So possibly one of the indexes may overstate or understate, just depending on what's going on with the cost of living. So this sort of three and four uh, will hopefully make sense to you. But um, the problem with the, the advantage Las Perret has is at least he's using quantities in a period in the past, in the base period. So it's easy to find that data. Whereas with Pache, he's always using the current period. And the current period is always changing. So he's always got to keep calculating the new period quantities. So it makes it awkward. By the time Las Perret is going to get his index out, before Pache can, because Pache has got to wait to the end of the year to gather all the data to know what the quantities are. And that's expensive every year to do that, whereas Les Perret only has to do it once and he's got it to you know, predict for the next 10 years if he wanted to. Well, along comes Fisher and he says, well, guys, the ideal index is going to be an average of the two of them. So because their index is rather than add them and divide by two, uh, he's, we multiply the two indexes together and find the square root. So the two indexes were pretty close, 181 and 178. Multiply them together, find the square root, and you've got Fisher's ideal index of 180.3.
It's saying, again, according to Fisher, prices rose by an average of 80.3. So maybe he did that to negate some of the effects, potential effects of understating or overstating the indexes, a little more of a conservative approach, perhaps. Um, how could we, how are we going to apply these indexes? Imagine back in the past, rent uh, in Sydney perhaps was $325, a particular, you know, home unit or whatever, $325. And you wanted to see what you wanted to try and make some sort of prediction as to whether that rent has um, kept in line with inflation um, in, in the future. So what you could do is, uh, so that was 2004, and you um, uh, 2010, six or seven years later, when the, the CPI index is showing that, you could actually convert, just like we were doing with the share portfolio. You could say, look, give me the rent in the old period, multiplied by the index in the new, divide by index in the old or base period. And potentially, I should, if rent went up at exactly the same rate as the rest of inflation, I should be paying $385 uh, in 2010 and 11. Could be paying more, could be paying less, but it gives you an idea as to whether you've kept track if you're ahead of inflation or rent is a little bit behind inflation. So um, we, we'll just do one last calculation, I believe, real salary. It's the actual salary and we deflate it by, uh, we, we try to convert it to real terms. What can it buy using the CPI index? So uh, let's have a look at how we might apply that. Uh, we've got, we've gathered the CPI uh, index, consumer price index, which is a bundle of goods uh, parceled together to um, measured against a base period to, to work out uh, uh, what the increase in prices have been. And here's, we've got some actual salaries. And we're going to try and work out uh, what's happened. We're going to try and convert this to a real salary to see whether uh, how, what the purchasing power of her income is. So what we would have to do is um, convert to get the real salary, find the actual salary. So the actual salary, for example, in 2011 was 91,200 and convert it back to what it Potentially, if it had kept track, uh, convert it back to 2002, 2003 by multiplying by 141 over 174, brings it back to a salary of 73,617. So in real terms, we've, we can't buy as much with our salary in 2010 as we could in 2002, 2003. Converting this 91,000 is effectively the same as 73,617 back in 2002 and 2003, and yet back then we were actually earning $78,000. So in real terms, we're not earning as much in 2010 as we were back in 2002 and 2003. If you said, well, what sort of a what sort of a decrease in real purchasing power does that represent? Uh, the real wages you calculated in 2010 minus what they were back in 2003. Put it over what they were back in 2003, and we've dropped our purchasing power has dropped by 5.62 percent. So there it is. Uh, hopefully that um, makes sense for you. We'll definitely be working some of this in our tutorial questions. Uh, looking forward to catching up with you when we meet.